Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast, where we seek progress, not perfection. Hello, and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Here we go again, Tro. Welcome, man. How are you doing? I'm very, very glad to be here. We have somebody that's uh, also part of the Rebel Forces going to take you back from the dark side, Brian. So uh, yeah, maybe you know, convince she, you about DPC. She jumped out and helped me too when I got picked on by your your pediatrician friend over there, Tro, in England or wherever that was, because we talked a little bit about addiction. So Molly Rutherford, MD, she's a family medicine doc, bluegrass, family wellness, direct primary care, drinking the Kool-Aid with Tro. Uh, an actual addiction specialist. So first of all, Tro, I have a bone to pick with you quickly. Your wife's cookie company. I got a little batch of it and I tried it and I gave my, I never should have gave my wife some. She had it. And the next day I'm in the garage working and she goes, where's the number for that place? How do I order more? What? I'm like, Hey, can I do it when I'm done? No, no, I need to order some. I, my friend wants some. I'm going to do I'm like, Tro, I had to place this or I didn't even get to place it. She did it. She already did it. So I said, okay, I'll, I, I had a little break and, and uh, I said, okay, I'll order it now. And she said, I already did. It's already on the way. And she got it already. So you created a, a monster at my house, Tro. I've been very good at only having one little one every now and again, but they are, I hate to admit it, they're pretty dang good. And so now we have the addiction specialist here to help us figure out why her stuff is so dang addictive. Rosette's stuff is brutal, man. So anyways, Doc, thank you for joining us. Sorry Thank about the rambling. We could, I had to get it out there so you could help us. <laughs> no problem. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. So we're going to mute and you can tell us your story, how you got into this, how you got into direct primary care, family medicine, addiction medicine, all these kind of things. Okay. Well, I, it's a long story, but um, I have never been sort of a traditional med doctor type person. I, um, I went to med school late. I was 29 when I started med school. Um, so uh, just with that background, you'll realize why I eventually ended up in this low carb space. But um, after med school, we, my husband and I ended up leaving North of Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, where I trained, which was Eastern Virginia Medical School. And at that time, I just I wanted to be a family doctor. That was pretty much what I wanted to do when I started med school. I knew, always knew I wanted to do family medicine, even though, you know, I would do my surgery rotations and people would try to talk me out of it. <laughs> um, I, I just, that's what I wanted to do. It was my calling. So um, after residency, uh, we, we got sort of called out to Kentucky. It's just things aligned and we ended up out here. Um, I took a job in a rural practice doing, um, I was working for a hospital system, but it was in a rural area and I got some loan repayment, which was very nice. And then my husband, he always wanted to be a, a, a police officer in the city. So he, he's a homicide detective in Louisville now. Um, so when we got out here in 2006, I joined a practice that had already been established, but had been sold to a hospital system. The doctor that I was working with, he had originally owned the practice, but then when administrative burden and everything became a problem, he sold it to the hospital system. So um, it was right around 2006 when the opioid epidemic was really getting going in Kentucky. Um, we were starting to see some overdoses. It was in so. I was exposed to that immediately. And I, that was something that I really didn't encounter when I was in Norfolk. Um, it, it was, I'm not, I'm not really sure why. I, I think probably because Norfolk is sort of the, the standard drugs like um, cocaine and heroin that people usually become addicted to do were very readily available in Norfolk. And I don't, I don't think that was the case necessarily over here in Kentucky on the Ohio river. So um so people were using mainly pills. And so there was a lot of people coming to the office, either, you know, in legitimate pain or maybe not in legitimate pain. But anyway, it, we were just seeing a lot of it. And then it became clear after a few years that um, that many of these people who were coming in saying they had pain actually had addiction. And um, that was when I decided to go get my buprenorphine waiver and I became a, a buprenorphine prescriber, which is better known as Suboxone, is the, is the uh, brand name drug. 
Um, and then once I started doing that, I just really loved it. It was, it was quite remarkable how people's lives would change once they got started on medicine. So um, just became fascinated with addiction in general, just how, you know, the disease and, and realized that, you know, we've, as, as family docs, as primary care docs, we, we've been treating addiction all along, whether it be to nicotine and then fast forward years later when I realized that, you know, there's food addiction and carb addiction. Um, I just loved, I just thought it was fascinating. So I decided to go back and learn more and then took the board exam in 2012 and became board certified. So um, it's been, it's been really awesome. I've enjoyed treating addiction. Um, and when I started treating addiction, this, this is really interesting, but um, I was, like I said, I was working for a hospital system. So I went to the administrators and, and basically told them I wanted to start this, this buprenorphine treatment program for people with addiction. And they were, they were on board with that and thought it was a great idea. Um, and so the first year when you become licensed to prescribe buprenorphine, you can only have 30 patients that you prescribe for. So um, when the second year came around and I wanted to increase my panel to 100, they, um, they didn't want me to because, and basically it was because they were not getting reimbursed for the services. So they weren't making any money by me helping out this community that was ravaged by addiction. So um, at that point, I started moonlighting for another company who they had several addiction clinics throughout Kentucky. And so I would work, you know, one or two days a month for them. And I would see maybe 20 patients while I was there. Um, and it was all cash based because again, nothing was really, this was 2008. Nothing was really, um, nobody was mandated to cover substance abuse services or, or I think maybe they were supposed to according to parity law, but anyway, nobody did. So there was no, nobody was able to get reimbursed for services. So, um, as I was working there, I really enjoyed just the time that I was able to spend. And it was, it was a huge contrast to what I was doing in the primary care world, right? Um, Cause you know how it is when you're in, when you're in primary care, you know, the MA goes in and then you go in and you have maybe seven minutes to spend with a patient. And then you're focused on, well, how am I gonna code this? How am I gonna build this, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas when I was moonlighting for this, this company, I was able to spend, you know, just kind of sit down with people and say, hey, how's it going? And, you know, let them talk. And, and it was just very refreshing. It was how I, I guess I had imagined medicine would be in the first place when I started, you know, down this path to become a doctor. And um, so um, that was when I started to, you know, really realize that our system is so broken, you know, why, why we're not able to really help people in primary care because we don't have enough time. And um, fast forward a few years and I ended up starting uh, my practice where I was, I decided I was going to do direct care, direct primary care, as well as um, direct addiction care. Um, and in between there, I kind of, I, I worked for one other practice, which was a patient center medical home. And that was, that was a disaster. I mean, it was just very volume based 30 to 35 patients. This was right after the affordable care, Act, affordable care act came out. So we were transitioning to the electronic medical record and it was, it was just a very stressful situation. So, um, I was happy that I, I found out about direct primary care. I read an article, watched some videos with Dr. Josh Umber from Kansas and he, he really helped me get my practice started, which was amazing. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what I'm doing now. And I think it was 2015, 2016 was when I started to learn more about low carb. But um, if you, I'm kind of rambling, so if you want me to stop, you can. <laughs> no, that's great. Tro and I always get get yelled at for cutting people off, so we're we're, we're being careful. No, yeah. no, okay, no, it's great what you're saying, and and you know, I'm curious about how you started making this association between the addiction medicine part of it and the low carb, and how they complement each other, and how what you've learned along the way, because I think this is an area of medicine where a lot of doctors are very arrogant about it, and they go, oh no, there's not nothing. Food isn't addictive. 
but they look at all their patients getting more. It's just like you could say opiates aren't addictive, but everyone's hooked on them. Then there, there's got to be a problem. We must be missing some connection somewhere here, guys. And so that's why it's great to have you on to say, look, from an addiction standpoint, here's how it works so right. that we can kind of tie these things together. Right. And well, and I always, I had already started to hear that from some of my patients who had diabetes, for example, or people, many of my patients who were pre-diabetic, who we, you know, we would have that conversation about making lifestyle changes. Um, and, and many of them would tell me, I do well for a while. And then all of a sudden I, you know, grab a bag of chips and I'm just not able to eat three handfuls, I'm going to eat the entire bag of chips. And so really they were the ones telling me I'm addicted. I'm addicted to these carbs. And then, um, meanwhile, this is just like how my life has always worked out. I, I didn't really seek out low carb. I've never had a weight problem. I've never really, um, needed to diet per se. Um, so, my friend who we vacation with some friends every summer and uh this one couple they're from hong kong they live in hong kong and so my friend joe who i have a, i see once a year we went to the beach and he had completely changed his lifestyle the year before he was complaining of all this foot pain he was really miserable um he was overweight and i guess during this year, he had gone and over in Hong Kong and seen a physician who recommended looking into low carb, and he had lost so much weight. He cured this neuropathy, it turns out, that he had in his foot. It turns out he was pre-diabetic, and so that kind of started the ball rolling, and then sort of at the same time, one of my patients is... Um, she was a, a teacher of this program called Restart, which I think one of your other guests had done Restart, which is um, pretty much a sugar detox. And um, so we had spoken and she started doing classes at my office and offering for my patients. And I saw some amazing results with them. And basically what they were doing was eating real food and keeping the carb count low. They don't call it keto. They don't call it, you know, even low carb, high fat, but this restart program is a way for people to just detox off the sugar and redirect their lifestyle. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to do this because I want to know, I want to experience this for my patients. I want to see what this class is like. I want to, I want to try this and see if it's hard to do. Um, and, and I, I mean, I, my diet was basically all carb, by the way, like I just ate whatever I wanted. And a lot of it was processed because I'm lazy. You know, it was, it was, it was pretty much all carb. And weight wasn't an issue for you, so you never thought about it. That's what a lot of thin people who are metabolically sick think. They say, well, my weight's normal, so I'm fine. I can just keep eating terrible food. Right. And, no, know, but yeah. I had a lot of other problems that I didn't realize until after I did restart. I mean, I knew I had gut problems. I had gut problems my whole life. So I was, you know, as a child, I had gut issues. I was, I was a tired kid. You know, I was more of a, uh, you know, I was that kid that needed to come home and take a nap. <laughs> you know, and have a snack, which was always carbs. And, um, you know, I drank Coca-Cola when I was two years old. We actually have, um, an audio tape of my, of my parents' child abuse. <laughs> Make you drink Coke. Yeah. Yeah. My mom has this on audio tape of, um, of me going, I want a Coke. I was about, I, I might've been three, but I was very young. And so I, I mean, I was, Seriously, I think I was addicted to Coca-Cola as a child, and I look back on that now, and, you know, I realized how bad that was for me and for my health, um, but again, like, the weight was never an issue, so you, you just don't think about it as much, and then, um, so the gut, the gut health was a problem, and then um, my thyroid went bad after I had my oldest son, um, he, I, I was a third year resident when he was born and I ate junk. In fact, I craved Pepsi when I was pregnant with him. So all I ate was, you know, processed food, junk, sugar, the whole time I was pregnant with him. And, um, and then 
three months later, I thought maybe I was just exhausted because I was a resident and I had an infant and, you know, I was working hard, but it turns out my thyroid was gone. Um, so I had, uh, I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and I've been on, um, hypo, you know, Synthroid since then. That was 2005. Um, so I, I, you know, I can't say for sure, but I, I have a feeling probably my diet had a lot to do with that, um, from what I've been reading lately. And then, um, I, I ended up getting diagnosed actually with a rare kind of colitis called collagenous colitis a few year a few years ago as well. So a, a lot of autoimmune things just um, and then I have I have ADHD, which I don't know, maybe you can tell I'm all over the place. But um, so th those symptoms got better. Um, I don't take medicine for that. But when I when I did the restart program, I mean, the first thing I noticed was my gut. Like, it was just unbelievable. Like, I just didn't have um, bloating, didn't have all these problems that I had before. And, and pain. I would be working. I can remember being at work and being in so much pain in my gut, having a hard time listening to my patients. You know, I mean, it was really, it was really debilitating. And I, but I had lived with it for so many years. And I had seen so many doctors. And they were just like, irritable bowel, irritable bowel. Um, you know, now I realize that, you know, I have clear grain, it's probably grains, because whenever I eat grains, it kind of comes back. So, so that, that was really eye opening for me. And then I read, I read the obesity code, uh, uh, the obesity code, the diabetes code. And then I, I just, I mean, it changed it changed my life. I'm sure you, I'm sure you know this and felt the same way because that's not what we were taught in med school. You know, we were very much taught the, the calorie counting and the food pyramid and, you know, it's all about willpower and, um, you calories guys in calories out. Yeah. Right. I, you so we're waiting to meals. get one guest that hasn't been inspired by Jason Fung. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Just, you can't find that person, Tro. We're going to keep doing this till we find one person that hasn't read the obesity code, the diabetes code. Yeah, but I mean, in the meantime, I have this friend of mine who, you know, we've become really good friends over the years. He, it's actually his, his wife is my good friend. She was in my, um, in my wedding and we went to college together. But, you know, since we've been hanging out as couples, I've become good friends with Joe too. So I've been able, you know, we, we WhatsApp back and forth and he recommends podcasts to me and uh, books and so forth. So he really helped bring me up to speed on the, on the whole um, ketogenic diet and um, low carb, high fat. And then I, I um, got plugged in with diet doctor, got plugged in with um, IDM network and I just have been fascinated by it. And just, I mean, when you, when just the documentaries, everything, everything I read, just, it kind of makes me mad. I'm sure you felt this way. I'm sure many of your patients have felt this way when you, when you, um, when you think about how we were told to eat low fat for so many years. And of course, we're going to be replacing that fat with, with carbohydrates. And, um, and then just knowing how addictive those carbs are, you know, thankfully, I'm not really susceptible to addiction per se. So um, binge eating and things like that were never really my issue. But I, I see it in my patients all the time. And, and when, when you think about addiction and what it is, it's really, um, I've heard it described as the three C's, which is craving, craving is part of addiction. Um, compulsive use is part of addiction. So once you get started, just kind of that binge process and then continuing to use despite negative consequences and and so that's that's really what i see with with any of the drugs of abuse with alcohol with nicotine and then now with food and um i've had a, I've had a few patients who did really well seemed like they had reversed course they were you know they had lost weight um reversed prediabetes and then something stressful happens like uh, one of my patients I think his mother-in-law moved in with them and he, his his rationalization is I'm the one preparing the food nobody else wants to eat low carb and uh, you know he's just kind of back 
in that um, in that cycle of I would I would call it relapse with any other drug, you know. Um, and it's exactly the same. The things that trigger relapse on um, on drugs and alcohol are the things that trigger relapse on carbs and sugar. It's you know. Yeah, it's uh, the same thing we I, see. And I know Tro wants to jump in here. Yeah. yeah. But, so one of the things that I think well, there's two really insightful things that you we kind of like you, you touched on, and I want to highlight one of which is you know, you highlighted the three C's of addiction. And meanwhile, you know, these fat cat scientists and academics, they don't even agree on the term food addiction. So here you and I are, we see this every single day, uh, people who are addicted to food, right, who are eating to the point of self detriment, like I was, I was a 350 pound doctor eating to the point of self detriment, I was you know, I would eat boxes of uh, ice cream bars and then somehow try to rearrange the wrappers in the box to make it look like it wasn't as bad as it was. Or, you know, I'd eat at night when nobody was there. And, and so I had terrible binge eating and um, I didn't realize, you know, I thought that moderation was my problem. You know, my, that was my issue. And I didn't realize that these foods are literally making me more hungry. So well, how do you, what do you say to these scientists and these you know, nutrition PhDs and academics who say that food addiction is not a thing, sugar addiction is not a thing, so it's not a disease? What would you say to that? Well, I, I would say that they are probably um, isolated or insulated somehow. Um, I'm not familiar with the people who are claiming that, but I would imagine they're bench scientists or people that don't actually see patients because um, it's just, it's exactly, it mirrors other types of addiction exactly. And, and, and one other thing that I see among people who, who, are addicted to opioids or alcohol or nicotine. Nicotine is is the famous one. Everybody who quits smoking gains weight. They replace everybody replaces their substance with something else. And so when when I'm helping people because it's all fundamentally in the brain and we know that sugar and carbs increases the dopamine within the primitive brain just like drugs, just like alcohol, just like nicotine. So that to me is settled science. I don't know how you argue that. Um, you know what they say? Just to tell you what they say. They say that, yeah. well, we need food to survive. We don't need alcohol to survive. And we don't. So that's the crux of the argument is how can you be addicted to something you need? And I'd argue that that's not the case because nobody needs cupcakes and Snickers and Dunkin' Donuts and you know, nobody needs exactly. these things in pizza. And in fact, no other organism, you know, eats to the point of self-detriment unless it's man-made food. That would be my contention. But I mean, this is their point, you know, that like, right. how can you right. be addicted to food? You need it. Well, I don't think that's a good, I don't think that's a good argument because yeah, I mean, people need certain medicines also for their, you know, some, some people need opioids to help with their pain. Um, not everyone becomes addicted to them, um, you know. So, so by that argument, are we saying that nobody needs Adderall for um, ADHD? Are we saying that nobody needs um, benzos occasionally for panic attacks? Like they're, I don't know. It just seems like a flimsy argument to me. And um, the, we know, like we have the the uh, functional MRI mapping. We know what happens to the brain when people eat sugar and eat carbs. It's exactly the same as what happens when people do drugs, you know, um, maybe not to the extent, maybe not to the extreme, but it does cause the release of the same chemicals. Yeah, so, we're, able to, we're able to get rats to chew sugar over cocaine. Right. Um, exactly. Um, absolutely. We've seen it on functional MRIs, what happens to the reward centers of the brain. They light up even with mild glycemic excursions. It's like mm -hmm. they light up. The part of your brain that's lighting up is not the, you know, the prefrontal cortex that's like, oh, maybe I should have chicken and broccoli. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, maybe I should, you know, have pizza, ice cream, milkshakes. I'm in 100% agreement. Yeah. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Because you mentioned this, and I, and I think it's so important. And I know Brian has mentioned it as well. And it's something we talk about to my 
to, to bypass patients, a concept of addiction transfer. Now, if you look at weight regain, when it happens after uh, bypass, it's about a year to two years. When you look at alcoholism and when it starts to increase its incidence uh, after bypass, it's a year to two years. When you look at divorce rates that happen um, with gastric bypass and bariatric surgery, it's after a year to two years. So can you talk to me about like this addiction transfer and, and you know, uh, I know Brian has said, you know, hey, look, you know, you're going to go on a low carb diet. It may be like you're losing your best friend. I mean, I sure as hell know what that felt like going from six ice cream bars a night to, right. to second, what's going on, you know, and needing to seek out pleasure elsewhere. Mm-hmm. I'm not, and I'll, I'll, I have to admit, I'm not really sure about the science on this. I'd have to look into it. But I, but from my experience treating addiction for the past um, ten years or so, um, I see it all the time. You know, um, and what, and when I counsel people about it, I, I tell them to expect that you're gonna you're gonna replace this with monster drinks or coffee or you know they, it's just it happens all the time so i try to steer them toward replacing it with exercise <laughs> you know i just tell them the one you know the one addiction that's probably not harmful would be exercise so if you you know i try to get people to to get to the gym early in their recovery so that they're going to have that, you know, the benefits, the brain benefits from exercise will be there when, you know, when they're ready to taper off their medicine, for example, or if, um, you know, stressful times come up and they, and they're feeling like they want to use alcohol or whatever. Um, yeah. So, that's interesting. I'd never really thought about that with, with gastric bypass, but I, I do remember reading an article about people kind of um, drinking, getting more into alcohol a few years after gastric bypass. And it, I mean, it just makes sense. It's kind of like the, the brain hungers for what it wants. It wants those, do those dopamine spikes and it's going to find it somehow. And so maybe even finding a peaceful place, right? Or being relaxed and calm. And, you know, that's one of the things that people, I don't think appreciate enough about the ketogenic diet or a low carb diet is when you're not having those constant sugar fluxes and all, you know, when you have ketones floating around that are calming, people don't get that stress. I have to eat something right now. They can look at their watch and go, look, I'm going to be home in an hour. I'll eat then. Right. It's not, I think a lot of people just say all the time, almost every day now I, I have people say, gosh, I feel like I'm free for the first time in my life where I'm not a hostage to worrying about what I'm going to eat in an hour. What else if I don't have food? What I mean, the people, their whole day would be obsessed with worrying about when they're going to eat, how they're going to eat. how, how and, and so I think when you take that stress away, that, that has a huge factor. And I think Tro has talked about that a lot also where when people relapse is almost 100% of the time, getting, it may be 100% of the time because of a new life stress. Something happened in life that gave them the stress. Now, some people may just say, hey, I was out with my friends and we went out to dinner that night. And if it's a true addiction or, or had that first drink when I went out with friends or had that first cigarette, and then they couldn't stop it after that because of the addiction part of it came back. And it, it's, well, and it's Yeah. And it's very individual what what people can. There are, there are people who can you know, cheat, I guess, if they're on the ketogenic diet and be, it, they're fine, they get right back on. And, and that's not really, I wouldn't say that person has addiction per se, although addiction is, it's definitely, you know, it's not black and white there. It's gray. Some people have more severe addiction. Some people have uh, less addiction. Yeah. I think there's some people out there. I, I mean, a lot of us, you know, it becomes a lifestyle. You say, I'm going to come home from dinner, have dinner. Then we have some snacks. We watch TV, have a glass of wine, then it's two. And then it's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a habit more so than they have to have it. And then once they break that, they say, oh, it's easy. I feel so much better. I don't miss that old life. Right. So it's not that they're like sitting there all day, like, waiting to get that glass of wine when they get home, that that's their motivation. But I think a lot of times that becomes their lifestyle. Then they don't exercise anymore because they're just lazy from drinking at night or whatever it is. And so sometimes it's just a lifestyle issue more so than a true addiction, maybe. Right, right. And I love what you all say about um, progress, not perfection, because that's so much of what we do in the addiction field is we call it harm reduction. 
um, and there, it, there's it's it's interesting when I became um, specialized in addiction I you know I was always very pro medication for opioid addiction for example and I, I had no idea there's this whole other sector of, of medical professionals and counselors and rehab facilities who just don't believe that is recovery they don't believe taking a medicine to help um, with opioid addiction is is true recovery and um you know that it's dangerous if you're if you're addicted to heroin or opioids to not take either methadone or buprenorphine because when you relapse on opioids you die and you know I, i've unfortunately seen that my husband being homicide in louisville um they respond to uh, death, all uh, you know, all death investigations. So suicides, overdoses, um, um, shootings, and all homicide or suspected homicides. So he, uh, you know, he, a, a few years ago when it was really bad here with the overdoses, he would, he would, we would kind of talk, and he would ask, you know, um, we would, I would try to find out if it was ever a patient that I treated and I would joke and say, it's going to be one of my patients because my patients are on medicine, so they're not going to OD. Well, one time it was, it was a former patient. I hadn't seen her in six months. She had um, been sort of pressured by family or people that didn't believe in taking buprenorphine. Um, she'd been pressured to go off of her medicine and to go to a rehab center. So she went to Tennessee to a rehab center. And then she did fine for about three months. And then something happened one night and she, she relapsed and she OD'd and died um, from fentanyl. So, so um, you know, the, the addiction field is really interesting in that way in that um, even, even if you go to an AA meeting, oftentimes they will, they will not be very tolerant of people who take medication for their opioid addiction which is ridiculous because they're all smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and, yeah. you know, so, so I've grown to realize that so much of what we do in the addiction field and really in medicine is harm reduction, right? So, you know, it's awesome when we get these patients who just do great and they do low carb or, or they quit using or whatever they do and they stay on it for five years and they're, and they do wonderful. But we have to try to remember that, you know, people are people, we're all human. They're likely going to stumble from time to time. And, you know, if they're just trying to get them back on track and reassure them that, you know, progress is really what we're seeking, not perfection. You know, I, I just want to like say two things because I think this is really important. One, the concept of treating obesity like a chronic disease okay, uh, is very important to me, diabetes as well. And that's why, you know, we're getting patients on these scales, on the CGMs, right? It's so we never lose contact, you know? Imagine you had an alert right away if a patient, you know, was abusing Suboxone or buprenorphine, right? Imagine you had an alert, like that's what we have with these body composition scales. We're alerted to changes in water weight, which we see if somebody's eating more salt or eating more sugar, right? We're alerted to changes in glycemia right away on CGMs. Mm -hmm. So we've, like my approach has been to adopt what you're saying, like let's treat this, like never let the leash too loose and be there as a support and as a pillar. Now, you know, so I, I think that food, you know, absolutely we've had wild success treating it like an addiction. Now, the other thing that, that really interested me based on what you said, and I, and I say this all the time, you know, a lot of times people ask me, well, can I eat Diet Coke? Can I drink Diet Coke? Can I have Rosette's cookies? Can I have a Quest bar? And most of the time my answer is, well, like, look, if you don't need it, don't have it, right? Well, and if you're going to be out there having a chocolate bar and, you know, stuffing your face with chocolate and pizza, well, then maybe that, you know, fathead pizza and blaze pizza and the Rosette's cookies looks like a really good option. Because you're not going to have these glycemic excursions. You're not going to have these, you know, okay, so maybe in that case it's helpful. And I say it's kind of like methadone. You know, why would you go? You're going to get hepatitis C from that heroin needle. You're going to get, you know, like you're going to overdose. You don't know if it's Chinese fentanyl. Um, hmm. So sometimes, the, you know, like this sounds like your patient had a catastrophic outcome from fentanyl, right? So the thing is, is 
Well, does it help everybody? No, there's people who abuse Suboxone, and I'm sure you've seen that too. There's people who abuse the Quest bars and Rosette's cookies. And, and so, you know, the, the question is, is tailoring, you know, does it help you? Is it serving your goals? And that's what a good provider like you does. You look at the patient. Is this Suboxone? Are you slowly tapering off? Are you doing well? You know, yes, you are. It's helping them, you know? Yeah. You know, same thing with foods and these fake foods and Franken foods. You know, I asked, you know, somebody came in here not too long ago and said, Doc, I, I'm so terrible. I feel so bad on myself. I had four Quest bars. And I said, well, what was the circumstance? Well, I was about to eat a chocolate bar. I was at a gas station. I was just about to buy the thing. And, you know, I was about to buy Snickers and this and that. And I was like, you know what? I have some Quest bars. I had one. I had two. I had three. After four, I couldn't even dream about eating. And I was like, well, why do you feel bad? It sounds like that was a win. You know, it sounds like you use your Suboxone instead of, you know, doing the Chinese fentanyl and having an overdose. Right. So what are your thoughts about all this? Do you think that I'm a quack or do you think this makes sense? No, I think it makes sense. I think it, 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 that's a very good way to put it, actually. Is, um, but, you know, I was thinking about Quest Bars being, being able to binge on. I can't even relate to that. That's, that's proof that people are so different, you know. Like, I just... It, and and that's one thing that I that I love about direct primary care too is we can sit down with that person that individual and and realize wow I couldn't even eat one whole Quest bar I think they're disgusting like <laughs> I can't imagine and so yeah I mean I think you're exactly right like that's that's a win um, and when my patients come in and they are, um, I see this all the time, actually, people come in and they say, well, I had a really bad week. This happened, this happened. I took extra of my medicine. I would rather them do that than go out and use for sure. Um, but we still have that conversation with, where I say, well, what, how did, did you feel different? Did it help you? Did it make that situation less stressful? And the answer is always no, no, it didn't. You know, and that, that's the other thing about addiction, too, is that many people realize this is not going to help, but they can't, they can't stop that compulsion. You know, they can't recognize that before they do it. Um, and so, you know, I just have to remind people often now taking another, taking an extra Suboxone is not going to help you, is not going to make your day any better. And, uh, and then you're just going to run low. So you're going to have more stress in two weeks, you know? Well, you know, yeah, I, I just saw something on Twitter I liked, you know, it was a guy saying, hey, you know, what happens with people, they blow it for breakfast, they have pancakes, and then all they go, okay, I blew it, it's Saturday morning, I'm just going to blow it today. And then the next day they wake up, they blow it again, because it's Sunday, and then they go, well, the end of the month's next week, so I'll just do it. He said, if you dropped your cell phone and it fell on the ground and you, and you just, nothing happened to it, you dust it off and put it back in your pocket. But what you're saying is you drop your cell phone, nothing happens to it, but then you smash it and keep throwing it against the wall until it all shatters. He said, look, that little mess up in the morning is not ruining everything. You just get back on track, you know, put the cell phone back in your pocket and move on. Don't crush the thing for a month. Right. So right. I think there's a lot of that in addiction. I think there's a lot of um, poor information. I think, you know, one of the case Tro and I talked about, I, I had a patient with fatty liver disease and she asked my opinion on how to get rid of it. And knowing the, the science on this low carb diet or intermittent, intermittent fasting and, and, but she's a binge eater. So her nutritionist called me and, and before I knew it, she was, I didn't even know her at all. She just yelled at me before I could even say anything. She said, you're, you're going to lead this patient to binge. And I said, well, if you look at the data, the data says no one binges on real food. You don't build, binge on steak or you don't, no one gets no. potatoes and eats them until they throw up. But if you have French fries, highly processed food, people will. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. And so I said, what should I tell my alcoholics? Just have a beer every once in a while so they don't binge on alcohol. Because if they have no control over that relationship, there is no such thing as moderation, right? Unless you can control it. Right. Yeah. And Dr. Exactly. Simon says that. He says, you know, if, if you're not in control, you should get, you know, you should get out of that relationship. You know, so this is like the comment of, do we... Do we abstain or do we moderate? And for most people, it's look, you abstain as long if you can. If you can get off those narcotics, get off of them. Sure, go ahead, you know? But if you can't, well, let's work on like, what is it gonna take? And I think one of the things that you talked about here is that compassion, like, and the non-shame atmosphere that's needed to evaluate what is actually driving my Suboxone abuse. You know, is it like that stress? Well, how can I deal with that? Like, Having somebody come in and say, 
I was stressed and I, this is what I did. Like they start thinking, well, what is it that's causing me to do it? Right. right. And they start in a non confrontational, shameless environment, you know, the shame and blame cycle and self psych it's like so strong that people don't even want to admit to themselves their own mistakes in an effort to protect themselves and protect their self-worth and, you know, all of these things, there's like a strong emotional component. And so right. how do you be there for them? You know, um, you know, if you're this like hardliner that Suboxone is evil, you know, how are you going to be there for them when they abuse it? How are you going to help them when they are abusing it? Exactly. And then, you know, opioids are a totally different. They're a little bit of an outlier because, because they are so lethal if you have a relapse. And, you know, when people relapse, it's usually after they've been completely sober for a year and their tolerance is gone. And then they go back and they use what they think they could have used before and they die. So, you know, opioids are a bit, a bit different from everything else, just for that reason. Like that, that alone justifies um, buprenorphine most of the time for me because um, it saves lives. You know, you're, you're half as likely to die from your addiction if you, um, if you take medication. So, but, um, but I mean, I'm so flawed. I think that, um, that it should be a requirement to be like, to have some world experience and to be pretty flawed before you become a doctor because it makes you have more empathy. I mean, we're all flawed, we're all human beings are. But I think that, just, um, I don't regret the way that I came to medicine because I think that a lot of the mistakes and everything that I made when I was young um, have really helped me to relate to people, you know. Um, so I'll, I'll just I'll just admit that I I did some field research in um, in alcohol use when I was in college. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people have. I think a lot of people did. Yeah. I, I, along those lines, I have a question for you on this. What's your uh -huh. idea? Like someone has a, a long history of alcohol abuse and people say, well, can I have an O'Doul's every now and again? What do you think, doc? Is that okay? And do you think that leads them back down that path again? What's your experience as an addiction specialist looking at those kind of things? Because that's how I kind of live. That's what I tell my patients with regard to, you know, if they're going to eat Rosette's cookies all the time, say, look, cookies are your addiction. At some point, you have to get off that sweet taste you have to you have to get uh, you, looking at your nutrition and so i think i would love to hear your opinion before i give mine on that with regard to the oduls and, and the non-alcoholic beers that do have well, a little bit i would of say oduls is totally not worth it so no <laughs> just for the taste right yeah I mean, <laughs> yeah so it's kind of like I, i've gotten to that point now because sweets were if anything probably sugar was was the one addiction that i did have um, I've gotten to where if I'm going to, if I'm going to eat something sweet, it's going to be something really, really good. Like I'm not going to eat an Oreo. That's not worth it. Um, but again, I think it's very individual. You know, I have, I have, um, patients who I, I would, I would be comfortable saying, okay, yeah, I don't think that would be a big deal. You seem to always be able to get back on track. And then there are patients that I would say, no, absolutely not. You've already proven that you know, you can't, your, your addiction is just too strong and you can't, um, you know, you can't self-correct. So, um, and, it, and often it depends on where they are in their recovery too, at least with, with opioids and alcohol, you know, the longer out, it seems, um, the easier it is to, to maybe have the oduls and not completely fall off the wagon. Um, but one other thing that I have seen anecdotally from uh, a couple of patients is who, who have opioid addiction and, um, you know, addiction to other drugs is that when they, I've had a couple that have gone low carb just because it's, it's kind of a fad now, you know, to try keto and go low carb. And they have noticed that all of their cravings for everything are less. So, you know, that's just another example of how um those those primitive areas of the brain are involved in all of it all of the different addictions yeah you know i love to hear that because when we talked about well, the, the reason all this addiction stuff came up as you know was uh Tro was talking about his, several of his patients had given up pornography and everyone said that's crazy that has zero to do with food why, why are they even talking about this but when you understand addiction you say look that was their coping mechanism 
it wasn't the sex part of it. It was a release for them. That's how they relieve their stress. So if someone shops or someone does whatever they do, uh, that's a, a maladaptive habit. Uh, a lot of times that's their coping mechanism, whether it's just, even if it's just going and playing video games and being shut off from your family, right? So it, it is, it's just such an interesting area and we start seeing this. And that's the thing that's shocked me. And I know Tro also was saying these other addictions that don't really have to do with food uh, right. or, or drugs or whatever it is uh, seem to get better. They get less cravings and they stop doing some maladaptive stuff. Maybe they're less likely to cheat on their spouse, maybe to make bad decisions, especially if you're not drinking, obviously, because alcohol clouds your judgment. And you start making dumb decisions that mess up everything. You eat bad foods because, you know, you're drunk and you don't care. It's two in the morning. And you just got done with the party. I mean, everyone's kind of been there. So right. I think it's that, those kind of things that, that we see that are kind of surprising and shocking because Tro was not trying to treat their pornography addiction. That was not the issue. They were treating a different issue and that got better. And, and episode number 13 with Carnivore Cruise really uh, hit my, you know, really woke me up a lot because I said, I asked him that question that we talked about earlier. I said, did you just replace one addiction with another? Because first it was food, then it was pornography, then it was alcohol. And I said, did you, did you just place one, replace one addiction with another? And he said, no, I just added to my tool belt. I was addicted to all that stuff. I just yeah. kept getting addicted to more and more stuff to get that part of my brain. And then he goes carnivore and all those things go away and he doesn't have any addictions anymore. And yeah. so when people say that's crazy, well, that's that guy's story. And a lot of people have come forward after that saying that's their story also. Can I, well, can I, I, just... think, I think I'm seeing some of that and I get really frustrated with all of the discussion around opioid crisis and opioid epidemic. Because um, really what we're seeing now is we're seeing people going back to meth. You know, they're going back to other drugs now that pain pills aren't available or, you know, they're too afraid to use heroin. It's I, addiction. To me, addiction is addiction. And, and I see that all the time where they, people go from substance to substance to food to, and like I said, the one, the one healthy transition that I've seen people make is to exercise. You know, I've, I've met many people who that was how they quit smoking. They started running marathons or, you know, um, and, and so I, I think we just, I think it's fundamentally the, the areas of the brain that are involved in the neurochemicals. And I, and I do believe that we will eventually have a better understanding of all of it because I think there's going to be more, more money spent um on the research side of things but i think you know we we've, we've become so opioid obsessed that we're not even realizing uh this is not going to just go away if we solve opioids people are going to they'll use something else you know um and often with the overdoses it's not just an opioid it's it's many different drugs or medicines that they find in the person's system so so yeah that that does it it doesn't surprise me now now that i've been doing this for so long but um you know i i would love to see i've got to do my my addiction moc which is another topic that <laughs> is annoying but um so maybe i'll look for specific articles on that and see you know where um all of the overlap is among all of these substances because you know we see it it's it's real you know i i just want to put in a put this example out there brian because you mentioned up and we're talking about addiction i have now seen someone who spent over forty thousand dollars in video games you know, online video games, resolve. I've seen porn addiction on several accounts, resolve. I've seen gambling addiction, resolve. I've seen people no longer interested in alcohol, okay, uh, from changing their diet. And look, lo and behold, we had a study that came out two weeks ago that showed a dietary inter intervention decreases depression. And we know depression and mood disorders and mood instability make all of these issues worse. Right. right. So it's not now it is in the evidence. And we know, we've known this for a long time. We know if you have a B12 deficiency, your diabetes is worse. We know if you have a vitamin C deficiency, magnesium deficiency, chromium deficiency, your diabetes is worse. We know that people with uh, uh, nutritional deficiencies or, or do worse in chronic pain. So, I mean, we know this, but it's just these, you know, uh, prima donna, you know, infectious disease uh, residents who, you know, like to call us zealots. 
But these are all things I've seen in my practice. And do I, you know, know exactly what it is? Is it maybe that everybody's just trying to get their life together? I don't know. But they're all saying, I just lost interest. You yeah. Know, I just don't want it anymore. Yeah. And they're all saying the same thing. I know. I know. It's the, I think, you know, it, we, we do kind of, we get in our evidence-based medicine kind of bubble or um, high horse. And I mean, in reality, some of the evidence that we have for, for things that we do is it turns out not even that great, you know, <laughs> It's, yeah, it just it, got handed down and handed down. Everyone just yeah, knows that's the way it is. Conflicts of interest with uh, you know, statin research, with uh, antidepressants. You know, nobody ever talks about the fact that the placebo effect and the uh, talks about the placebo effect in the antidepressant trials. You know, and how the the difference between the placebo effect and the actual medications is not that impressive. So, um, yeah, that, that's not the kind of stuff that we get told when we're in medical school and you have to be a critical thinker to go and, and seek out those answers. So, yeah. And, you know, and I think with the addiction thing, if we see it that way, you know, cause I think the problem with obesity is we've always seen it as not being smart. You know, the person's dumb, lazy, and you know, doesn't do anything and they're gluttons. And that's always been the mindset and I see people and I really, because I've struggled with obesity my entire life. So I see, I understand where people, a patient, if they cancel two or three appointments with me in a row, I know what's going on, right? Tro can monitor them and look at it, but I know what's going on and we all know what's going on. If someone stops going to church or they stop going to their social functions, you know, something's going on, right? There's their men's support group, whatever it might be, or female support, group, whatever. Um, so I think it's those things and people have such a shame and, and it's hard because once they go off course, they don't want to deal with it anymore. So they just keep going off course and they don't have friends that reach out and go, Hey, I haven't seen you in a while. How are things, you know? And so many times I've had friends do that. You know, you reach out to them and you realize, yeah, he's, he's been drinking every day and his wife's leaving him and all those kind of things. And, and he, right. he, he doesn't have that support. So I think it's hard. And I think as physicians, our role is to support, people i had a guy who relapsed came uh, with food and he came in and he was devastating because i didn't want to see you i don't want to talk to you i don't want to deal yeah. with it right i don't want to get weighed i don't I, i'm I, and, uh, and the last thing he needs is for me so you idiot you blew it right say hey look man you're not the first one who's blown it. you're not the last one you'll probably blow it again we've all blown it okay what do we do well, let's start from here you know you dropped your phone and this dust it off and get back on the horse right so i think a lot in with addiction i know I, i've always thought man i can never do addiction medicine because of that that relapse rate is so brutal you know, when you invest so much in someone and then they fall off the, uh, off the wagon and they're a disaster, right? And you have to pick right. them up again. And, you know, so how, how do you deal with that in a practical way? What, what are your kind of, how do you handle that situation uh, clinically? Relapse. Um, well, it's been a learning process because I, you know, I've gone from being sort of um, more close-minded, I guess, and less tolerant of people relapsing to uh, we basically, when we have new patients, we tell them we expect honesty here. Um, you know, we, we do some urine drug screens, but we, we it's, not a, it's not something that we make people come in and do multiple. We, it, our foundation is trust. So, um, you know, I ask people to, to be honest if they've relapsed and, and some of them still aren't you know, and then that's when we have the conversation, oh, well, now you're going to get a bill for $30 because you made me do that urine drug screen because you, you know, the, the send off because we'll do the cup, the cup will come back a certain way. We'll, we'll ask the patient, okay, so what happened? We're seeing something on the cup we're not supposed to be seeing. They'll deny it and then we'll send it off and we'll confirm that they were, you know, that they were lying. And it's all part of that shame. They feel bad already and they don't want to disappoint the other people that they care about um so it it takes a while to get to that point where um you know i've, I've had patients that have seen me for years and they're finally at that point where they'll just come in and say you're gonna see this this is what happened you know and and we we can have a conversation and it's awesome because i can just say uh, um, okay, so what happened? Where were you? 
was it, you know, what was the trigger? Was it a people place thing? You know, was it stress? Was it, you were in an environment where the, the drug was there. And so we work through that and, and we talk about how to avoid that or how to redirect in the future. If that, if that um, same scenario presents itself. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, okay, you went over to your friend Joe's house and you know, Joe still uses. So either you need to not go there. If you want to remain friends with him, then just do it over the phone, you know, be friends over the phone, text each other. You can still be supportive. You can be there for your friends, but it's clear that you can't be in the room with cocaine <laughs> or you're going to use it, you know, so yeah, or cookies or donuts or whatever it is. Right. I right, mean, that, that right. Same thing. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's very tell the waiter to take it off the table. That's what we tell you. Yeah. Know, that's what I tell him. Take it, tell him to take it off. Don't even order it with the potatoes. Like, no, you don't want the French fries. You don't even want the bun. You don't want to see it and ask for twice the meat while you're there. So exactly. You know, don't yeah. go to Joe's house and go to twice the church that you need to go to. One throne. We got the, we have the, I, I tell my patients now, I go, okay, let's see how things have been. I go, you know, I have a lie detector test, don't you? And they're like, what? I say, yeah, because <laughs> I'm going to run your, your lipids. I'm going to look at your triglycerides, your HDL, your insulin level, and A1C. And they don't lie. <laughs> and I the people go, I okay, someone. well, I was on a cruise. <laughs> Here's what happened. <laughs> you know? I just saw someone the other day. He had had a the the reason he ended up coming to me was um, he had had a stroke five years ago. So he was diabetic and he ended up having a stroke. And um, within the past year, he has gone keto, very strict. He has um, reversed his diabetes. Um, he he insisted on going off of his statin. I was kind of nervous about that. Um, but we discussed it and then I saw him recently and he's like, yeah, I've kind of fallen off. It's all these, you know, football parties, you know, watching college football. Um, and so when I ran his lab, certain, I confirmed his A1C had gone up. He's not, it's still not in the diabetic range, but it's going up. It's creeping up. Triglycerides are creeping up. So we had, a, we had a talk and just came up with a plan for, okay, you can still go watch college football with your friends, just bring your own food, bring, you know, bring wings, bring things that are keto friendly. And, um, his wife was very supportive. So, so yeah, I mean, he's, he's one of the people who, who realizes that, um, <laughs> actually going back to his old diet could, could kill him, you know? Um, cause he was, he had a severe case of metabolic syndrome that led to, a stroke. Yeah. yeah. When you realize the implications, I think that's it. I think that, that to me, that's what proves the addiction part of this, this, if your sugars are 300 and you have to eat donuts and cookies, there's something wrong because you know, you have enough sugar floating around. You don't have a sugar deficiency. Right. And I think that's one of the big things where we, as a society, we've been wrong as far as how we're managing our diabetics, because we're telling them you have to eat 50 grams of carbs with each meal. When your sugar is 300, why? I've asked everyone I know, what, why? Why do I need more sugar when my sugar is 300 in that system? And no one can answer the question. They go, that's just how it is. You need 50 grams three times a day. without looking at the logic of saying this doesn't make any sense at all. There's no, there's no justification for that. So I think in the poor people, it's, and if they're out of control with carbs, you give them 50 grams of carbs, you're going to have 200 grams of carbs, right? Because I'm like, well, sensitive, and I can't even imagine what 50 grams of carbs would do to me. Because I, I actually did the CGM experiment recently. Like, I wore a, a continuous glucose monitor because I was just being a dork. Yeah, I do, too. <laughs> yeah, I've been worried. I've learned way more. I mean, right? You learn yeah. more from that than you could have reading all the right. books in the world, right? Right. And so I had the, the most surprising one for me was, um, was like a, an, a sports drink after I worked out that had stevia in it and it spiked my sugar to 149. So it was supposedly a low sugar because it had stevia, a sugar substitute. And it's still, I ended up with a spike. And then, um, I flew somewhere and I don't like to fly. So I drank a beer and I ate some pretzels with it. And I think I went up to, you know, 160. Just Yeah. And being stressed, worried, that kind of stuff can do right. it too. I mean, there's so many things that affect this thing. It went right back down because I'm insulin sensitive. But then my issue has always been that I, that I go wait, I go too far down. And so then I need to eat again, you know, after I have a high carb 
I was a grazer. I ate all day because all I ate was carbs. So my sugar would spike up and then plummet and I'd have to eat again. And then my sugar would spike up and plummet and I'd have to eat again. Like, can I, yeah. Yeah. Then when you can realize, I, yeah. Let me just tell you something about that. You know, we were talking with somebody about CGMs. I have an insulin sensitive person just like you who was told she had chronic fatigue, thyroid issues, all that nonsense. Right. And, um, Really, we put a CGM on her, and we found that she has exactly what you have, basically yeah. reactive hypoglycemia. On her normal diet, she ha was having, in a two-week period, 30 hypoglycemic events over two weeks. On a low-carb diet, after two weeks, she's having less than, she's having four hypoglycemic events, like quote-unquote hypoglycemic events. Yeah. I mean, so cutting her carbs stabilized her blood sugar, Yes. That is huge. People do not understand the opposite. That. The yep. opposite of what we were told, right? Yep. Uh, and our type one. My fasting blood. When I would do my fasting blood work, I would have to bring food with me because I would feel like I was going to die. You know, sitting there in the in the waiting room waiting for my blood to be drawn, and my sugar, my fasting blood sugar was always like fifty. So um, since I went low carb. I had my fasting blood work done not that long ago. Of course, my LDL went up. I don't really care. But um, my, my fasting blood sugar was like 80. And, you know, I just felt, I don't feel this urgency to, you know, immediately eat when I wake up anymore. And yeah, the chronic fatigue, I'm sure somebody would have given me that diagnosis at some point because that was, that was totally, even before the hypothyroidism, you know, I was a napper. I was just, I just accepted, I'm the, I'm a low energy person. I just, I have to have a nap, you know, <laughs> and um, it, that's nonsense. I, you know, I just, I feel amazing when I stick to low carb. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people are coming to that conclusion. A lot of people are feeling that way. I think when you keep your hormones balanced, you don't have your stress hormones firing all the time and you can have a more even sugar. I think people just feel better and they, they recognize that even before the weight loss. And so we're and seeing a lot of benefit. I didn't even tell my whole infertility story either because, you know, and you, I've heard some of your other guests talk about it, but that's, that was another thing. Like, uh, we, you know, we have two kids, but I, I had, um, two miscarriages between the two of them. And then I had three after my youngest son and I'm sure I just was not giving them good nutrition. I'm sure that played a role in it. I mean, I was older. I think I was 40 when I finally decided I'm done, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think, I, and that is so common, just, just women really struggling to um, get pregnant in the first place and then to continue a pregnancy. I just, I see that all the time, you know. Um, yeah, I think we're going to learn a lot. I think there's, the science is still young on this stuff and we're going to learn a lot over the next couple of years, the next decade. You know, I think we're going to reverse a lot of the things we're doing because... <laughs> Our experience, our clinical experience, the continuous glucose monitors, what we're seeing in patients with addiction, depression, anxiety, stress, all these things we're seeing getting worse. It's all right. It, it wouldn't be a podcast without one dog barking. I can't believe my dog hasn't barked, so that's okay. Uh, yeah, so it's just, uh, it's just funny how, how much stuff is coming around that we're learning that weren't, that wasn't on our radar. It wasn't on my radar when I went low-carbon keto. It was weight loss and diabetes. That's all I thought there was. And then now we're seeing all this stuff and seeing people – um, just their lives getting better. And it's awesome to see and awesome to be a part of it. So yeah, do you have any really parting good. words of wisdom for us? Um, well, I think you should both, you know, get uh, wavered to prescribe you the morphine now. <laughs> you yeah. know, what's funny about that. I'll tell you what's funny about that in San Diego. I don't know if we're unique, but you know, most of the pain specialists in town are afraid to write opiates and it's a hard thing for all of us primaries because no, yeah. they don't want to deal with it. They go, we'll, we'll put in a, uh, stim, we'll do this, we'll do all this stuff, we'll inject you, we'll do that, but they're, they don't, they're, the liability of opiates are, are so, there's so much uh, yeah, fear out there right now, it's tough. Yeah, and I was, I was very much um, anti-opioid for pain until I, I, I participated in this, this um, federal pain task force recently, and so I heard, got to hear from a lot of people who are really being treated badly and forced tapered off their medicines, and so I, I've, I've achieved more balance since I did that. But 
Yeah. yeah we'll I mean, figure this out. We'll figure it out. It just takes yeah. time to having smart people like you doing addiction well, medicine and helping. Well, us. and definitely when people bring up opioids and try to demonize open opioids, just, you know, try to be a voice for it's addiction. It's all addiction. It's not, you know, there's not like, we're, if we get rid of this drug, addiction is not going away. You know, it's, yeah. um, it's just not. So. So Tro, do you have any words of wisdom for us, man? No, no, I'm just happy we're having these discussions, talking about this, talking about what we're seeing. And I think we glossed over one very important thing that uh, Molly had mentioned, that she was exposed to low carb by a friend who cured her neuropathy, his, uh, his, his yeah. neuropathy, um, doing low carb and you know resolving the diabetes he didn't even know he had. And just so you know, 30%, like a medical fact for everybody listening, 30% of patients with diabetes, their first symptom is neuropathy, right? Their first symptom is neuropathy, even before a diabetes diagnosis. So yeah. uh, I think that's just one thing that we can, you know, pass around here. And we glossed it over, but I thought it was really insightful. Well, not just that, Troy. I think the other take from that was, look, you're a doc. Someone just says, hey, I'm doing this diet. I feel better. And you had enough wisdom to say, okay, let me look at that. Is he crazy? Not crazy? Is he making it up? You know his character. So when we're seeing that, so many docs are so quick to say, oh, that's crazy. That's a fad that's going away. So I'm saying, let me look at it. Let me look at the data. That's what I had to do. When I heard about Jason Fung, I thought he was a nutcase, right? Fasting. Who's going to fast? You're going to shut your metabolism down. That's not right. Oh. Oh, there's still so much push. Oh, I thought it was on mute. So, yeah, so there's so much out there. So we, I think we just got to figure out how to uh, get, get people to at least have an open mind and look at it and say, okay, don't agree. Here's why, or I do agree. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. This has been a great discussion. Well, thanks, and have a great weekend. Thank you so much for, enjoy, uh, for enjoying for us, us, enjoying us too, I guess, <laughs> hopefully. Educating us. It. Educating it was fun. us. No, we, we appreciate it. It's really important for us because, you know, Tro and I are both very clear. We're, we're not addiction specialists. But when you came to our defense and said, look, I'm an addiction specialist. And yes, what they're saying is true. I was like, wow, that, that was really nice of you. And we really appreciate that because Twitter can be a war zone out there, you know. And so sometimes you get people and all their, their six followers come yeah. after you for an hour and you have to deal with it and try to justify what you're saying. And words are twisted. So all those things, we appreciate you doing that and for what you're doing and what you know. might actually be my addiction and i think i probably need to get some treatment <laughs> yeah well i'll get tweet twitter treatment yes it's so toxic all right doc thank you so much for joining us thank you toxic tro she's no, like she's, she's giving not. you a jab look, on the way out tro. This, is, this is how we all met right look at that well, yeah absolutely true. not you know so look at the connections we've made, the friends, the knowledge, you know, app, Twitter CME is better than any CME I've taken. So. I agree. I've learned a ton. I've You're learned right. a ton. And I, you know, low carb MD, I've learned more than anything, man. Yeah, yes. absolutely. For my, my, my uh, older partner, Tro. <laughs> uh, more handsome, less, less, less wise, but definitely smarter. <laughs> All right, man. I'll give it to you. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for listening to the Low Carb MD Podcast. We hope you learned something of value today. Please remember to subscribe and rate us on iTunes and Stitcher, as this will help us to get the word out. Please consider supporting this project through a small donation through Patreon. Every penny helps. Until next time.